Holly and Marisol, so we have some people from this congregation here. Good to see you all. This week I turned on Benny Hinn, and there was Jonathan Kahn on Benny Hinn, and I said, oh Lord, I'm preaching the word right in season. Hallelujah. A lot of preachers will not preach this type of stuff because they're scared. They don't want to tell the people the truth. We have a little two-minute opening video I'd like to show you. in Israel. 
Israel 27, 2300 years prior. The second parallel or second harbinger we see is the sign of the terrorist. The terrorist, this incident that Isaiah records in Isaiah chapter 9 is the first written account of a terrorist attack. And can you believe that these people that attacked ancient Israel in 732 BC are the same exact people that struck America on 9-11. They are from the same part of the world, the Middle East. They are from the same dialect. They speak the same type of tongue. They are from the same time. Second parallel. First the breach, then the terrorist appears. The third sign, the third harbinger we have is fallen bricks. Isaiah chapter 9 writes, the bricks have fallen, but we will replace them with hewn stone. The Assyrians went in, broke down the walls, made a hole or a breach, went in, attacked and killed one night and ran out and looted their town and took the nation by surprise. Israel was shocked, traumatized, if you will, the same way the nation was the morning of September 11th. And just as bricks had fallen in Israel on that hallowed day, bricks fell on 9-11. And we have a third prophetic parallel, the fallen bricks, as we go over to sign number four, or harbinger number four, the vow to rebuild. Israel's leader stepped out and says, the bricks have fallen, but we will replace them with hewn stone. The sycamores have been cut down, but we will replace them with cedars. What do you think you're doing, Ain't, uh, so the, uh, the, the Assyrians? You can't hurt us. We're going to replay. We're going to do this and we're going to do that. And we're going to do this. There was no turning to God. There was no repentance. National pride rose up. We're going to, we, me, myself, and I, we'll do this. We'll rebuild it. Not, oh God, would you protect us? They turned to their own accord. And the same thing happened on 9 11. They vowed to rebuild the nation. No repentance. No turning to God. No saying, Lord, protect us. We systematically remove God out of our schools, out of our government, and out of our nation. And then they say, where was God? Where was God? You're kicking him out of the nation. He cannot protect a place where he was kicked out of. He comes by invitation and covenant only. That's right. And our leaders get down there in September Nine and 2001 say we will rebuild we will come back stronger did anybody explain the context of the passage to them Isaiah is sitting there recording the response of Israel going oh boy this is not what God wanted we will rebuild we will replace boys I don't think you're getting it but you need to learn this for yourself and he records it down there as a warning to America. Now we're repeating the same mistakes that ancient Israel repeated. Sign number five. Isaiah 9 and 10 says, the bricks have fallen, but we will replace them with hewn stone. When they had this big hole in the wall, they had built their wall with mortar and, and stone and clay and mud. And the Assyrians had no problem breaking through. So they said, you know what? We're going to replace it with hewn stone. It's called gazit in Hebrew. So what do they do? They go up to the quarry in, in, in the Golan Heights and they carve out a 2,300 pound stone. This is in 732 BC. They carve out a 2,300 pound stone and they bring it back and they put it down and they say, now let's see those Assyrians get through and knock down our walls. We're going to make this place stronger. And what do our leaders do right after 9-11? They go upstate New York to a rock quarry and carve out a 2,300 pound gazette stone and bring it down to Wall Street and place it right in the spot where the towers fell. Can this get any more scarier? And there he is. All oh, Mayor Bloomberg, Mayor Pataki, and Jim McGreevy, the governor of New Jersey. And they vow, we will rebuild. We're going to do this. We'll come back stronger than ever. And they have a whole ceremony around the stone. Somebody forgot to tell them the biblical context of Isaiah 9, 10, and 11. 
And that leads us to the sixth sign. Why the parallels, Pastor? Why the exact same patterns and signs? Is God trying to send America a warning that if our nation's leaders, if our nation's judges, and if the left wing liberal media do not stop kicking God out of the nation, we are going to be in trouble? Amen. Three amens. I'm glad y'all get it. We systematically removing God from our nation. When we do that, he cannot help us. We are breaking covenant with him. I know this is a strong word, but is there a remnant in the house that's going to stand up in the last days and say, look, save the Lord. Bring God back to our nation. We will implode. The key to America is hidden in God's word. Join us today as we unlock the rest of the harbingers. So that, what is the purpose of this preaching, Pastor? Not to scare you, but to unction, give you an unction from the Holy Spirit to pray for our nation, to pray for our children, to pray for our next generation. That's why we're going back into that high school, to bring the gospel message to the lost children. Sign number six, the sycamore tree. Isaiah said the bricks have fallen down, but we will rebuild with hewn stone. That was number five. Number six is the sycamores are cut down, but we will change them into cedars. So what did the ancient Assyrians do? They broke down the walls. They went in there. They killed some people. They blew up the buildings. They ran out. And on their way out, it was called King's Highway. They cut down the sycamore trees on the left and on the right and on the road. Why did they do that? They were sending Israel a nation that your nation is being cut down. That you've kicked God out. They didn't know what they were doing. It was a prophetic sign to Israel that we're taking your nation down to the root. We're exposing the foundation. Why did they cut them down? It was a sign to them. It was a warning. Your nation is being uprooted. They weren't in jail. You see, they weren't interested in taking the sycamores with them. It was a sign. Now, what did, how do we tie this into 9-11? What the hell? Did these terrorists the 9-11 come with machetes and chainsaws and go to cut down sycamore trees at Ground Zero? Not really. But there was a sycamore tree Amen. that stood right outside of St. Paul's Chapel, next to the Twin Towers. Now when seven million tons of steel came crashing to the ground, not one scratch, not, hear me now, not one scratch on that church. But a 700 pound beam came tumbling out of the sky and hit Oh, help me, Jesus. Hit the sycamore tree right next to the church. Oh, I get the chills. And cut the sycamore tree down right at the spot of 9-11. Protecting the church from the 700-pound beam, but the beam had cut down the sycamore tree. And then they take the stump and they put it on display. Are you kidding me? Wow. Well, on the corner of Wall Street stands the chapel on the northeast corner where a 50-foot sycamore tree. As the tons of steel came down, the large beam cut the tree in half. And the picture of the stump is there. No one, hear me, no one but God could have arranged these circumstances. Jesus. You think the terrorists flying the plane said, oh, we're going to hit the plane, and the tree's going to get cut down, it's going to match Isaiah 9, 10? No way. Mm. Only God can do this. And then what do we do? What, is, what do our leaders do? Instead of turning and repenting, they hire a sculpture, a sculpture named Steve Tobin. He was commissioned to cast the recreation of the roots in bronze. And there it stands. And they, they, they go and make it out of bronze. Not silver, not gold, not metal, not aluminum, but bronze. The biblical sign of judgment. Jesus. 
Oh my God. And they go and put it on display. The sycamores have fallen. See? Here's the stump, and here's a recreation. Wow. And they even put a sign next to it. Thank you for the pictures, Deb. On September 11th, the debris from the collapsing World Trade Towers knocked over a giant sycamore tree that had stood for nearly a century in the churchyard of St. Paul's Chapel on Broadway in Fulton. When the dust settled, the tree was uprooted and found a narrow path in the yard. It had fallen in such a way that none of the historical tombstones around it were disturbed. Thank you, Jesus. And none of the wreckage touched the chapel. Sculptor Steve Turbin heard her the story of the sycamore envisioned using its roots as a base for a bronze sculpture. Installed on the fourth anniversary of the terrorist attacks, the Trinity group is a metaphor for our connectedness and our strength. You don't see God's name in there anywhere. The remnant of the sycamore's roots, preserved by Tobin with the help of the tree experts, have been returned to St. Paul's to reside. Apparently. Everything is just repeating itself. Jesus. Everything Jesus. is repeating itself. Wow. When that tree hit the ground in front of St. Paul's Chapel, it made two sounds. Number one, the sound of the tree crashing was the sound of a moral failure as a nation. It was a sound that we are allowing a moral failure in our nation. The second sound it makes is a sound of revival. The sound to wake up the church. The sound that we need to hear to say, not on my watch. Not on my watch. I'm not giving my nation over. I'm not giving my children over. And this is not going to happen. And today, we need to usher in the third great awakening right here in New York City. Yes, yes. It happened in 1864, just before the Civil War with Jeremiah Lampier started a prayer meeting on mm -hmm, Wall Street where over one million people came to Christ around the nation, which marked the second great awakening. My prayer is, Lord, do it one more time. Yes, but it starts in the house of God. Yes. You can't revive, well, let's have a revival meeting. Let's have a revival meeting. You can't revive what hasn't been born again. Jesus. Yeah. It has to be born for it to be relit and revived. What well, was so concerned about the building and about this and about media and music was so concerned about the function of the church we're forgetting about the mission of the church it doesn't matter what goes on in here we can do church like this no tomorrow the mission of the church is the lost that are going to hell in a handbasket it's those kids at the high school that need to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. It's about the people in the apartment buildings and the highways and byways that are looking to be set free and looking for a savior and looking to get away from drugs, alcohol, and crack. People need the gospel message. And that's why we're going back. I was on a conference call with Fernando Cabrera in the mayor's office on Friday. And he said he'll be introducing a bill in the next two weeks. We need to pray that would stop this banning the church is going into schools. And they're going to put it on the floor. And I don't know what's going to happen. We're going to win the vote. It'll get vetoed. And it'll do all of this other stuff. And, and it's also in Albany. And uh, uh, Sydney Sheldon, uh, did you see Sydney Sheldon on the front page of the paper on Wednesday? $103,000 scam. We were praying outside his apartment building, Phil. We were outside there with uh, Pastor Rick Del Rio praying in front of his apartment building. God's about to shake the nation. God's about to shake some righteousness into the government. And I talked to Fernando Cabrera and he says, you know, Christy Quinn's running for mayor in 2013. And she said, oh, I get in. No, I'm against you guys. All right, that's cool. At least we know where you stand. <laughs> So we interviewed the other four guys, Bill de Blasio and Ray Kelly, some Republicans, some Democrats. And they said, listen, if we get in, if we get in, we're going to take this, this thing that the Board of Ed created and throw it in the garbage. Don't worry about it. 
Do you understand what I'm saying? Come on. Yes. That we get the right person for mayor. Yes. We're good to go. That's right. We're good to go in the high school for four years. We could start our building fun. We could get on with our mission. Amen. That message was brought to you by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Sign number seven. <laughs> Cedar tree. Isaiah 9 10 says the bricks have fallen. We will replace them with hewn stone. The sycamores will cut down. We will replant with cedars. Why did they replace the sycamores with the cedars? It was a sign of a more stronger, more resilient tree. A cedar was stronger than a sycamore. Israel, instead of hearkening to God's voice, heeding and repenting, in the spirit of defiance and said, we're going to put stronger trees in these spots. Somebody call the landscaper. And Hebrew, the word is caliph, to change, to replace, or replant. The Hebrew in cedar is called eres. It's an eres tree, or a panacea tree, or a coniferous tree, something that blossoms green. Like a pine tree you would place for Christmas. They're all the same family. The bricks fall, they replace, they replace them. And in Israel, with the Gazit stone, the bricks fall, the buildings fall at Wall Street. We replace it with a Gazit stone from the quarry. Same thing. The Assyrians leave, they cut down the sycamore trees to say, it's a warning. God is uprooting your nation. Then in 9-11, a sycamore tree gets cut down to protect the chapel where George Washington gave his inaugural address. And it's another sign. And what do we do? What do our leaders do? Instead of repenting, they go up to the mountains and go get a cedar tree. And they take the cedar tree and they bring it down to ground zero and have a big ceremony. Ha! Ah, the sycamores have fallen. Ha! Ah, we're going to replace it with a cedar. Just what the Bible says. Are you explaining the content of the scripture to them? So they go get a 50 foot tree with another crane and they lower it down into the spot and they have this big worship ceremony over the cedar tree. Help me, Jesus. What are they thinking? And they say it's a tree of hope. Never mind turning to God. They call it the tree of hope. Can this get any scarier? My goodness, it's the same arrogance with how repentance that Israel had. Both bricks were fallen, bricks and cedars fell, bricks and sycamores fell in 732 BC. And in September 11, 2001, both bricks and cedars, bricks and sycamores fell. Both lowered by cranes to be replaced. Both had ceremonies around them. Both labeled the brick and the tree as icons, the tree of hope and the freedom stone. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, 11, these things happen to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us in whom the fulfillment of the age has come. God says in his word, I'll give you signs and I'll give you wonders and I'll give you prophetic fulfillment that so, so we, the church, will know before anyone else. And then we are responsible for preaching and teaching the truth. I'm glad when I get in front of the Lord, he's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. The Bible is clearly our roadmap. God is clearly talking to our nation. Thank God for Jonathan Cohen yep. and having the courage to write this book. Yep. If you don't have it, Amazon.com. We weren't going to go fill in the back table. You can get it online. Even more interesting, on Wall Street, in 1792, nation was only 15 years old. 1792, a group of New York businessmen get together down on Wall Street to sign what's called the Buttonwood Agreement. There it is, 1792. They signed this agreement, a bunch of businessmen that would eventually become the New York Stock Exchange. But where did they sign it? Under a sycamore tree. A buttonwood is a type of sycamore tree. So they signed this agreement, the buttonwood agreement, they become the initial perpetrators of the New York Stock Exchange. There's a picture of the Stock Exchange. The buttonwood agreement, they were the founding 
fathers of the New York Stock Exchange, and they signed it under a sycamore tree. Mm -hmm. After 9-11, they turned around and looked at the foundation of the, of the Reserve Building, and there was a crack in the foundation of the Federal Reserve Building. What was God saying, Pastor? That our foundation is being crumbled. We have to get down to the roots. We have to get back to the Bible. We have to get back to prayer. We have to get back to repentance. We have to turn back to the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, Jesus Christ. Time is getting short. Let us turn to God so we can turn our nation around. And after replanting that tree, suddenly an economic shaking happened in America. Wall Street, the housing market, the incredible debt. What was going on? I want to explain to you the mystery of the Shemitah. The mystery of the Shemitah. Now, what is the Shemitah in Hebrew? God, everybody pay attention. God told the Israelites in Leviticus, every seventh year, I want you to stop planting crops. God is the creator. He knew. So six years, the seventh year, all the market shut down. You don't sell crops, fruit, vegetables, and, and you don't do that. God said the land needs to rest. Well, he must have known. Geologists have found out if you let the land rest with the rain and everything, it provides the proper nutrients, and then the following year you get like 20, 30, 60-fold crop because the land gets replenished. So God told Israel, on the seventh year, I want you to let the land rest, and every seven, seven times seven, I think, believe it's 49, the 49th year or the seventh year, he, he wipes out all the accounts. Put a cap on For example, if Aileen and Will owned the corner store, and I had no money, and I went down to the corner store and said, hey, you know, I'm waiting for my check to come, and, and can I get a quart of milk and a loaf of bread? I mean, I don't know. Yes. All right, see. Not gonna distract me. I would go there and say, "Can I have a quarter, a quarter of milk and a loaf of bread?" And they would, they would. Have anybody ever run up a tear before? You don't have to be embarrassed. I've done it. I've ran up a tear before. And, and and God said to Israel on the seventh year, it was their responsibility to erase the debt. No debts. Erase the debt. Why? I said to the Lord uh, this 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 week, preparing the message. Why did you do that? He said, "I didn't want." The business owners and everybody scamming people. Oh, you want a credit card? Yeah, I'll give you a credit card. Get a credit card. Credit card. Credit card. Credit card. Now you're in debt to me for the next 15 years, and I'll charge you an unsurious interest rate, 15, 20 percent. Now you're indebted to me probably for 30 years. So God, in His wisdom, said, "I don't want that to happen in Israel." So every seventh year, they were under the obligation to wipe the slate clean, to release me of the two dollars and forty-nine cents for the bread and the milk, right across the board. So what did Israel do? They became so prosperous, so strong, and so wealthy. They said, I'm not going to follow that rule anymore. Mm. And they went seven, ten, ten, ten cycles. Seven, 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 seven. They went ten cycles of seven or seventy years without letting the land rest or without wiping the accounts. And God said, okay. Babylonians came in and took Israel into captivity for how long? 70 years. Preach on, Pastor Chris. I think I will. Because <laughs> they failed to obey his word. He said the land is going to rest for the same amount of time you disallowed it to rest. All creditors would have been wiped out. No debts. The slate would be wiped clean. It was a national blessing. He would wipe out all accounts. Mm -hmm. Israel got so hungry for money and power, they did away with the law of the Shemitah, never let the land rest, and they got put into captivity. What did they do, Pastor? They put their work and the economy before God. Mm -hmm. Preach. <laughs> and God removes them so the land can rest. Can this be taught to America, Pastor? Ooh, I'm glad you asked. I'm glad you asked. On September 8th, on September 2008, wait a second, September 11, 2007, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 years to the month, almost to the date, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and Lehman Brothers collapses. And in one day, God wiped the dead out. Ooh. 
Now, if we go back in Leviticus, what day did God say to wipe the slates clean? The 29th of Elul. If you don't know the Hebrew months, I'll teach them to you someday. He said on the 29th of Elul, wipe the accounts clean. On September 28th, 2008, it was the 29th of Elul. The day the stock market crashed was the same day in the Bible that God said, I'm going to wipe the accounts clean. And America, if you don't hark into my voice when I call you, and do not turn to me and repent, the same exact day, everything collapsed. And how many points did it collapse? Seven, seven, seven. Seven meaning the biblical number of covenant. God was saying, you've broken covenant with me, America. And I'm going to wipe out all the debts. You're not going to scam nobody in the mortgage industry. The banks aren't going to scam anybody anymore. You better listen up. I'll wipe the accounts clean. $72 trillion. In one second. Wipe the way. Only God. Lord have mercy. Oh, has he wiped out Israel's national debt? So too, the economic collapse resulted in wiping away a tremendous amount of debt. The banking shut down. The mortgage collapsed. The debts were wiped out in one day. The 29th of April, September 28, 2008, seven years almost to the week of the terrorist attack. And on the same day, the 29th of Elul, that he said in Leviticus to wipe the accounts clean. And it crashed 777 points. The greatest crash in history. It's all linked together. I can preach you the truth. It's all linked together. Let me just say this. We're better off with God in our country. Do you understand what's going on here? We are better off with the Lord in our country. And I can't vote for nobody that's not on God's side. I can't have a Republican or Democrat. I was on the phone the other day. They were half and half. We had bipartisan support, both Republican and Democrat. We need to vote the Bible. Yeah. We need to vote the Bible. Is there a divine connection between the work here in ancient Israel and the United States, is God trying to turn the nation of America back to him? There is a purpose in it. A nation heading for calamity. God is saying, no, don't go that way. And let me tell you about the character and the nature of God. It's always redemptive in purpose. Which means when you have a son or a daughter and they act up and you have to punish them and have to send them to their room or do something, your purposes are redemptive. You want them to listen to you. You want to redeem them. You want to teach them. That's what God's doing to our nation. It's not to hurt us. It's to say, if you hearken into my voice and listen to my ways, I will bless you beyond measure. But if you kick me out, I cannot protect you. We can't rebuild this nation without turning back to Jesus Christ. Our foundation. That's the seventh sign. The eighth sign, pastor calls it the utterance. Now, just as Israel's <laughs> national leaders got up there, after the Assyrians attacked them, they gathered the leaders together in the nation's capital, which would have been Jerusalem, the holy city, and they get up there and they give Isaiah 9 and 10. The bricks have fallen, but we will rebuild. The cedar, the sycamores are cut down, but we will replace with cedars. And Isaiah's sitting there under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writing this down, saying, oh boy, they don't get it. They're not returning to God. And uh, I'm recording this, and they found it in 1940-something in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the book of Isaiah, the second, one of the versions of it. So where's the parallel? Well, in September 11th, 2004, John Edwards, running for vice president with John Kerry, gets up in Washington, and he gives the exact same proclamation 2,300 years later. He boasts 
of the nation's defiance and power and says, we will, we will, we will. Hmm. There we go. Hey, on this day of remembrance in the morning, we have the Lord's word to get us to pray. The bricks have fallen, but we will build with bricks and stones. The sycamores have been cut down, but we will put cedars in their place. This is taken from Isaiah. Lord, we pray for our president, Lord. 
We pray for our senators, Lord. We pray for those in the House of Representatives, Lord. Lord, we pray for every judge and every mayor and every congressman. Father, awaken our nation, Lord. Father, we ask you to forgive us, Lord. Forgive the church for sitting by silently for too long, Father. Mantle this church, Lord, with the spirit of prophecy, Lord. As we go back, Lord, into New Dorp High School, Lord, and proclaim the goodness of God in the land of the living. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit goes with us, Lord. Lord, I know we're in the valley, Lord, but Lord, you said he who walks through the valley in the shadow of death shall fear no evil for thy rod and thy staff shall comfort thee. So, Father, I pray that you anoint this church with power and purpose, Lord. Let us not be so concerned about the function that we forget the mission, Father. There is a nation and a lost generation in New Dorp that must return to Jesus. So, Father, we pray a prayer of repentance. Father, forgive us. Forgive our nation. Forgive our leaders, Lord, for the spirit of confusion that is over them. That they've taken your word out of context, Lord. And with you meant for biblical correction, Lord, set us back on the path, Lord. And, Lord, we know we are on the cusp of the third great awakening in America. And Lord, we trust you with all our hearts and all our souls and all our mind, Lord. And Lord, I ask you to protect the remnant here today. Protect those who stand up for righteousness. Protect their families. Protect their jobs. Protect their businesses, Lord, as they are faithful in building your house, Lord. As you shape the nations, Lord. Lord, rise up a remnant in the last days, Lord, that will stand up for truth for justice, and for the Bible, Lord, and for your precious Son, Jesus Christ, Lord. And Lord, let there be a hearkening cry in the church that says, not on my watch. Yes. Lord, I pray, as we go from this house to our house, Lord, on this holiday weekend, that the truth that you've imparted through this best-selling book Bless the author, Rabbi Jonathan, Lord. Bless his church. Protect him and his family, Lord. As you used him to awaken a nation, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the Bible, for it is true. And Father, as we transition into our new position, Lord, let us invite a loved one next week, a neighbor, a co-worker, a friend, into our new house. As we become invitationally minded, Lord, to bring the gospel to those that are so in desperate need of salvation and eternal life. So may the Lord bless you and may he keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. May you be blessed going out and blessed coming in. May you be the lender and not the borrower. So Father, I pray a double portion blessing over the faithful saints of God, Lord. I thank you for your prophetic word the last two weeks, Lord, that as we stand in place, Lord, for righteousness, you will stand up for us in the last days. May God bless you, and I'll see you next week. Amen? If the men could help